you know, so over the past t- our two years, we've done four point one million dollars in top line revenue. Oh and my. without that. Just a quick Sorry. little round of applause. That's amazing. <laughs> Moment of silence. We we actually left high seven figures in revenue on the table during the bull run because it would have cost us our credibility. There was a project that tried to pay us 250K for a tweet. Oh, um, wow. R-O-T-N, let, let me present, present to you. you the Rotten Podcast. The Rotten Podcast. How do you want me to say it? Rotten. All right, guys, welcome back to episode 20 of the Rotten Podcast. I am so excited because today we have a special guest, Matt Medved. He is the founder and the CEO of NFT Now, the top news source for anything NFT related or crypto related. And not only that, you were, I believe, ranked top 10 most influential people in the NFT space by Yahoo Finance, which congratulations that is amazing thank you yeah it was it was uh it was really nice to see that recognition it was sweet that's cool that's so cool i mean you have a really cool history and background as well you grew up in rochester new york Mm -hmm. you went to new northwestern university in chicago pioneered billboard dance which uh ranked the edm and electronic music um, vertical and then you also worked at spin modern luxury and dj'd on the side you are like a man of so many talents You only get one life. So, you know, like I always loved like, you know, like the concept, like the Renaissance man. It's Mm -hmm. like, you know, just wearing all the hats, doing all the things, you know. Um, So for me, it's like, you know, why not? If you have a lot of passions, why not pursue them all? I mean, I know both Matt and I were like looking into you and we're like, wow, like this man's done a lot. Yeah, I had no idea. So I obviously found out about you, of course, through the NFT space, which we're in. We've Mm -hmm. been you know, avid collectors for the past couple years, um, going down that whole journey. But I had no idea you had this whole background in music, which I would love to get into because I'm an artist myself. Um, But how do you go from working at Billboard, right? Pioneering Billboard dance, which was helpful in breaking Marshmello, Kygo, these artists at the time. This was what, back in 2015? Yeah, that's when I started it. Yeah. Which is such an interesting time for music. But How do you go from being a journalist, working at Billboard to finding yourself being in NFTs, Web3 and running one of the largest NFT platforms? Yeah, it's a really good question. So uh, I think it kind of starts in in 2013. Um, I was actually so prior to getting into like music and media and like I was actually working for nonprofits and that's like a whole nother like past life. Uh, uh, another yeah. notch in your belt. I know, right. And I worked in Nigeria, worked in Zimbabwe. Wow. And like I was actually doing graduate programs uh, or like related to that, like a lot of masters. And I actually finished them at back to back exchange programs. And so I, w- I, um, I was living in Milan in 2013 and uh, the, the winter was really cold and I didn't speak Italian. Italian. And so I started spending some time on Reddit and I discovered this thing called Bitcoin in 2013, you know, ah, and, uh, okay. and I was like, Ooh, cool. And like, you know, I, I mean, I was, you know, like it was early days. I, I thought it was cool. I bought a couple of them. I bought the exact top of that market, by the way, like crashed like, like two 20, weeks. No, no, it was like 900 back then. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And then it crashed like two weeks later. And I, but I was like, you know what, this is cool. So that, 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 that's a little bit of foreshadowing for the story to come. So, um, after that, when I was, I was living in Berlin after that, and that's actually where I got the opportunity to start writing for billboard. And, um, you know, like you said, it was like my whole thing has always been about like uplifting artistry like I always say I'm a, I'm a curator not a reporter you're thing. a tastemaker yeah oh, I appreciate you saying that and so um my first feature for Billboard back in 2014 was Kygo and he had never played outside Norway and I was like this kid's gonna be huge um and I was just like I went on that whole ride like the whole ride with him you love Kygo they're like <laughs> I love Kygo. Yeah, yeah. And, and what's interesting is like dance music has been a cultural constant in Europe and and uh, South America and elsewhere longer than it has been. I mean, it's it comes from the United States, a lot yeah. of the biggest styles, you know, like techno techno comes from Detroit, house mm-hmm. comes from Chicago. But like, you know, as it, it's just, it wasn't as big in the mainstream. And so it was interesting is back in like in uh, back in 2014, um, you know, seeing this 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 rise, I just I, I realized I was like, there's this open lane there. And so um, I covered like all the big European like dance music festivals, met like so many artists who were going to be like really formative uh met uh martin garrix and like reconnected with the chain smokers guys who i knew like back in like the new york wow. like when they were like playing like n- like local new york clubs yeah. and um alice in wonderland and like black coffee and like it was just amazing and i was like yo like the fact that like billboard dance doesn't exist yet i'm gonna go start that and so i like came back to new york 2015 founded billboard dance built that into kind of like the leader in uh in north america certainly um but also like a a, definitely a global brand and what was really interesting was the um the next bull market in crypto uh 2016 to 18 actually like coincided to kind of like my peak years at billboard dance and so it was interesting 
I discovered that I was the only person at Billboard who A, owned crypto or B, understood it at all. And so I started doing some coverage of like the intersection of music and blockchain because I was really interested in how could this technology empower musicians? How could it empower creators? And especially like, could it disrupt what is a broken like you know, music industry model, right? Like super exploitative. And so uh, guys like Blau and RAC who are like artists who have been at the forefront of that, those, are, those guys are all my friends, you know? Like I, like I knew them just from being like, you know, in dance music with, with the DJs. And so it was really interesting because uh, um, a shout out to Blau who actually, he bought me my first ledger, like the hardware oh, wallet nice. in 2016. <laughs> so um, he's into crypto, I'm yeah, guessing yeah, as very well. Into wow. crypto. And I advised for one of his projects, um, you know, this like blockchain powered uh, music festival. It was just like a little early though. Like we're like, all right, how does this, how does this like technology apply to music? And it was actually, to be honest, kind of hard to get a lot of people in the music industry to care about crypto. And um, what's interesting is uh, after that, you know, I, as you said, I, I ran Spin Magazine as editor in chief, which was uh, amazing. That was like my favorite magazine growing up. So it was really special. Um, put Billie Eilish on the cover, like turned it around and then uh, I saw. exited with the sale of that in 2020, then COVID hits. And I was actually running content at Modern Luxury, the lifestyle publisher, when Blau pulled me back, he pulled, like, pulled me down the NFT rabbit hole. Um, and I remember having this conversation with him where I was like, yo, like I know what an NFT is, but like what I, what I really understand is why, you, why you're so passionate about them. And uh, when he explained to me, all the light bulbs went off in my head. And I was mm -hmm. like, this is the technology I believed in for a very long time finally disrupting fields I'm actually passionate about, like art and music and culture, because I'm not a finance guy at the end of the day. That's mm -hmm. why like I'd never like gone like full time into crypto or anything because like it just didn't, it, it didn't really interest me like that. Like I, I thought it was the future. I thought it was cool. You know, like I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm hodling. I'm, I'm part of the line for the ride, but, uh, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, I'm going to go like leave my current path to like go down some crypto road, but also, and then critically the last box that it checked was like, this has the power to, the, to empower creators. And I was like, this is it. And, um, and also I, I felt this conviction because uh, a lot of the conversation around NFTs reminded me a lot of like, the, you know, especially like the, the fear and the uncertainty and the doubt and like, especially coming from like the creative press and like, you know, the established institutions it reminded me a lot of how the financial press and, and, and the financial uh, system uh, responded to Bitcoin in 2013. And I was like, I have seen this movie before. I already know how it ends. And this time it's not magic internet money. Yeah. It's music, art and culture. And you don't bet against music, art and culture. Wow, I love that story. I love that you actually just did something that was against the grain and you're like, I see the vision for it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. And yeah. you started it NFT now in 2021 April. Ja uh, so we actually started January 2021 with the um the social accounts. Oh, even accounts. earlier. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It was it was well, the podcast important that distinction. April. Yeah. yeah. Those yeah. 3 months were like 3 years. <laughs> no, 100%. 100%. <laughs> You know, it was interesting because, uh, you know, when the Beeple sale happened, uh, that kind of yeah, like that, that, that like changed the, you know, the, the trajectory of everything. You know, it was like we started seeing crazy organic growth and the like, but also like that's when a lot of like the noise started. Right. And there was a lot of like, you know, people who got in for like just to make money and stuff like that. And like and w the fact that we were there for those early months, you know, like you said, it was only three months, but it felt like three years before the Beeple sale that we that NFT now existed. And so people trusted us like they trust us because they yeah. like they know it. They're like, oh, like you guys were here before the noise. You know? Before um, we get any further, do you want to explain to the people who aren't totally familiar with the Beeple story and yeah, the yeah. price it sold for? So yeah, yeah, you know, Beeple uh, sold the first uh, ever fully digital uh, artwork uh, as an NFT uh, at a major auction house. Uh, the first one to sell at a major auction house at Christie's, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it was a it was a composite of like all of his everydays because he does like he has this thing called Everydays where he he'll make a, a piece every day, and he's been doing it for now fifteen years. I think Crazy. at that at that time it was thirteen, and he did one of the first 5,000 days and it sold for 69 million dollars. Jeez. Yeah, crazy. Jeez. No one expected it to sell for that much. I, I mean, that you. that alone put NFTs on totally a such a larger map because now oh, yeah. all of a sudden you have the biggest publications in the world covering such yep. a story like this. My dad's calling me, asking me questions about NFTs because totally. these headlines and now all of a sudden people start rushing in and um, we started collecting NFTs in August of what? 2021. 2021. Yeah. That right? was a good time. It was a August good time. Was popping. Yeah. August was, was popping. That was right? the summer gold rush of NFTs, I feel like. Yeah. And for me, we also started just buying some cryptocurrency previously. And then yeah. we got, which I'm sure you've heard and know of BitClout. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I kept hearing about it, but it was that same feeling and moment you're talking about having where it's, all of a sudden the light bulbs click. I remember when it clicked for me, that feeling, I shared totally. it with her. I shared it with Andrew. I'm telling people around me, look, this is ownership. This is one of one. Look at what the technology actually means. Yes. Look, it's not just about the pictures. It's about 
the fact that you are able to utilize ownership in verification, the first way that we're utilizing it is through these NFT projects, but it's more about the ownership in the verification. Yeah. I mean, even within yeah. music. That's I, why you're so interested in it because you can relate it to your music and ownership and totally. verification. Absolutely. And I see so many holes in the music industry and being an artist and being an independent artist. There are so many inefficiencies that will be solved. And I know there are so many things that are already being solved with Web3, with NFTs, with tokenization, with building an audience on the blockchain that gets an incentive by by supporting an artist. They're going to benefit from the long-term value that that artist creates, right? Totally. It's not just you can support an artist early on and then they blow up and you're like, hey, a lot of times fans get upset. It almost works right. in reverse. They're like, I was with him and now all these Since people the like him. Yeah. Now there's that shift that's happening where it's like you can actually benefit off of an artist that you believe in long-term. Totally. And, and what I want to ask you and where I was going with that is where do you see the music landscape going? Because as yeah. an outside, not as an outsider, as someone who is an artist, as someone we have a successful NFT project, right? It has been interesting from my perspective where I see the pieces there, but it's it just doesn't feel there yet. Yeah. And I'm and I know I'm like, okay, there's gonna be a big shift that happens where there's gonna be something happening and there's gonna be a shift in a paradigm shift in music. Where do you think the music industry is headed with Web3 and where yeah. are we today with it? I love talking about this. This is a great, it's a really great question. And so like one thing that's really interesting is that um it immediately clicked for me partially because um like so, my my dad is a is a neurologist. He's a brain doctor. Oh wow! Um, and, but he's smart a, man. Smart man, but very and it, but also has a great taste in music. And so mm. he raised me on Beatles, Stones, Doors, Pink Floyd, like all the classics. Mm -hmm. And he actually collects rare Beatles memorabilia. He's like a Beatles super fan. The idea of collectability around music is something I grew up with, and so it immediately clicked for me because I was like, oh. So what you're saying is like anybody, like the idea of collectability, it's like, all right, like anybody can listen to Abbey Road on streaming, right? Mm -hmm. But not everyone has Abbey Road on vinyl signed by all four Beatles. And in the NFT and Web3 space, not only is that vinyl valuable for like the history and legacy, but it could also be your backstage pass to concerts if they were, you know, if the Beatles were still around. It could be your fan club ticket that, you know, you're getting that. And and one thing that, that Blau told me that really resonated with me was he was like, hey man, like, you know, or when I was asking, I was like, why are you so passionate? He was like, look, I know that I have, for example, it's like, I know I have fans in Mexico City. He's like, Spotify tells me I get this many tens of thousands of, of streams, but I can't reach them. I don't know who they are. Spotify doesn't give me that data. And if I have a show in Mexico City, I can't invite them. I can't tell them to come through. I can't like, you know, offer them a backstage pass or a meet and greet. But like, what's amazing is with a music NFT, you have, you can do a thing called um, a snapshot and you can see everybody who holds your music NFT and you can directly reach them. You know, you, like without having to go through a centralized platform dealing with an algorithm or ads and the like, and um, you can directly reach and reward them. And that's a really powerful shift. So what's interesting is I always say this, like the, you know, the use cases that really blew up over, over the last bull run, um, you know, I like digital art, digital collectibles, things like that. One of the reasons why I think that they blew up and they resonated as quickly um, is because we as society are already quite acquainted and, uh, and understand uh, the value proposition of collecting their physical counterparts, right? So for example, it's like, we all know, like, you know, the traditional art world, we know the idea of like buying it, buying a painting as an investment. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like, uh, and then, you know, having it as or like a store of <laughs> yeah, tax shelter. Yeah, those those free ports. But we understand that, and then it's like, okay, you know, this, you know, obviously, if the artist's career continues to go up, so does the the value of that. Um, this is the digital version of that. Cool, right? With digital collectibles, it's like, oh, okay, like this is, you know, obviously, it's it, it's different with community elements and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, Pokemon cards and like all the, you know, the baseball cards and like some of these other collectibles uh, that have existed, like the cause figures and things like that. Like, there's an analogy there, right? But with music, it's still a bit amorphous because mm -hmm. music is a gray area because because with music, we went from being able to pay $15 to $20 for one CD to all of a sudden $9.99 for all the music in the world. And there's a first off, there's a value disconnect there. And it's artists who have largely paid the price for that because, uh, you know, artists being paid, you know, a fraction of a penny per stream is ridiculous, but that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, what, what's interesting is for your average consumer, the idea of collectability and paying to own music is, is something that I think a lot of them still have to wrap their heads around. They don't necessarily have, it doesn't make as much sense as clear sense in the streaming era, right? Because it, it it's like, they're not used to doing that. And so what I think is going to be really critical is unlocking the power of fandom. 
it's going to be fandom that really does it because like what 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 I think people will understand are the experiences, the value of experiences tied to their fandom. So like talk to like we talked about Billie Eilish for example, like she has a rabid fan base, right? You give them the opportunity to go backstage and meet her, like that's mm-hmm. that's an incredibly valuable experience for them, right? And that's something that like you said with the verification that the you know like the trust you can you know you can't you can't forge an, an NFT like that. You can you know uh, and so being able to show oh you're one of my holders like oh you're one of my like early supporters all that you get access to that i think once that becomes better understood how nfts can unlock experiences and unlock and cater to fandom i think we're going to see um a, much more of like a, an understanding and embrace of them um the other thing i think that's really powerful in the music side is obviously like the major label system has been super exploitative for so long right yeah. uh, you have to sign away like 80 more than 80 percent of like your ownership of music and then like you get an advance that like you still have to like or pay back and it's like a lot so of people pretty much alone it really you, is. We were talking about this a uh, few episodes. She didn't know that. And I was yeah, breaking down traditional record record deals. And it's also sad because there's so many artists are also the victims of that. And it's, yeah. you know, they didn't, they didn't read the contracts. They didn't understand. It was just the way that it was. But now totally. there's so much information out there. There's been a shift where now you don't need that. You go directly to TuneCore, DistroKid, what have you. Your That's distribution right. is right there, nine ninety nine or 30 bucks a year for the whole thing. You know, like what, what's amazing is that there are now artists being able to use NFTs and the like to crowdfund, to like raise funds in a way that like they're not actually giving up a stupid amount of their ownership or their royalties. And so like, for example, there's a there's a really dope artist named Latasha. Shout out Latasha. She's amazing. I think she's going to be one of like the Web3 native like superstars in the music. Oh, wow. And she um she actually sold like a music video. Um, Like she made this. Like, she made like a really, really. Like, so you can't watch it unless you own her. No, no. You, you Anybody can watch okay. it, but only one can own it. So I, I, I have to remember it offhand, but I think it, it definitely sold for over 50K. And wow. and what's amazing is, and it's it's beautiful. Like it's well shot. It's like really well done. It's, it's like a work of art. And what's amazing is like, that's around the amount that you might get as an advance from like an indie label, but she didn't have to give up any ownership, you know? Mm-hmm. And and so like- Is she giving up the, uh, the monetary rights on like YouTube or is it just on like OpenSea? It, it was actually, it? it was actually on a platform called Zora. Okay. Um, but you know, I, I'd have to check, but there may have been like some utility or, or sharing there, but like it was nothing close to 80% or whatever, anything exactly. like that. And it may have even just been like more of like an act of patronage, you know? And so what's interesting is that there are some other artists who have done like crypto crowd funds. There's one, a guy named Ibn Inglor, who's really dope. And what he did was like, he gave, like he basically crowdfunded a project, raised the amount of money that he would have normally gotten from like a label advance. But instead of giving up 80%, he gave up around like 20%. And mm-hmm. instead of giving 80% to a record label who does not care about him other than like how much profit with the bottom line is, he gave it up to his, he, he gave the ownership to his true fans and you know like they can't shelve his record you know and that's like who would you rather own your your music like a record label that only cares about their bottom line or like or people who are actually part of your community and supporting what you're doing and it's a really powerful thing because then that power of digital ownership unlocks levels which is like now instead of just being a fan you're also a shareholder now instead of just being like like a like a fan you could be uh, an ambassador there's a, it hits different when there's ownership and like something like you said you know i always like think back to i was like damn like imagine if like nfts and that stuff had had been um more prevalent or you know was, was established back in 2014 like if, imagine if i bought kygo coin back in 2014 right like like you said being able to share in the value that's created cuz like look you know, the come up with Kygo was amazing. It was, it, I, I got a lot of value from that just like from my career, you mm-hmm. know, like I met so many people, like obviously it was like the called shot and all that. But like, imagine if I like had also, you know, like a share in the game of like a shit, like a stake in it, you know, from like his career. And I think that that's really cool. What, what, what um, a lot of these music NFT platforms are doing. There's one uh, called Royal that was founded yeah. by Blau. Uh, full, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm an angel investor in it. Um, but, uh, and it, and what's cool is with Royal, you're actually able to buy a buying a music NFT, you actually can get a share of the royalties from that song. So like if if you are like, yo, this artist is next and you believe in them and you buy like and you get it really early, like, you know, in theory, if that artist's career takes off. You could also see a like upside from that. Like, so that's what I wanted to ask you about, because there's a there's so many great things that you just said. I would love to. I'm trying to figure out which things are <laughs> that I want to unpack in what you said. One thing I do want to say with the music video per se, right? For people who don't understand NFTs, crypto and web three, the go, well, why can't I just, I watch the videos on YouTube. What people don't understand is that, you know, when people do this, say the screenshot thing, right? They're not understanding that, yes, you could have that screenshot, but 
there's no way to buy to sell that yeah, screenshot. You have no stare. Like, right? It's like taking a photo of the Mona Lisa. Cool. Cool yeah. story. Put you that can't on your sell wallet. It. No one's buying it. And you know? that's what people fail to to realize. But even in the case of the music video, people will say, Well, you could just watch that on YouTube. Well, it's almost like you're working in hindsight because as her career grows and as she continues to build a presence in Web3, now all of a sudden that music uh, video NFT becomes so much more value, yeah. valuable. And even with Royal, for example, because I've looked into it, of course, I, I was, uh, was it Nas who dropped on yeah, Royal? Nas, I, I, yeah. I, I, we tried we to tried get getting Nas, it. yeah. Uh, Ooh, we couldn't, yeah. We couldn't. That was a good one. I think, I um, think the... Uh, the business of Royal is so smart yeah. because I would love to like take a part in Billie Eilish when she was first starting out. Totally. I mean, it's a little too it, late it, now, but yeah. I have one point on that too, is like, how can I create value for fans without also on the other side, giving up maybe royalties or percentages of my music. If yeah. that is the way that I'm making money, the utility is the music mm -hmm. obviously, but like, there's that, that being early, like those bragging rights, you mm -hmm. know, kind of that thing. So sure. So how do we get there? Right. <laughs> yeah. Because if you were able to get Kygo coin back in 2014, <laughs> well, it would be a different right now, story. I don't think there is a complete market for it. There has been no mass adoption of NFTs yet. Although Nike and all these massive brands are in it for the most part, most people still see NFTs as a scam. And when they see Chris Brown dropping an NFT and they see um, <laughs> the Tory Lanez, Tory um, Lanez NFTs Frenchie and they're, they're taking advantage of their fan base, yeah. it makes it harder for the good actors in the space to succeed. Which is yeah. where I was trying to go with it is like, okay, how do we get there from a cultural standpoint? Yeah. You, we are going to continue to have these bad actors who come in here and create their own coins and pump yeah. it and sell it. We've seen that story over and over again. And that is also making it the 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 atmosphere a little bit fragile and yeah. it's deterring people from wanting to when they hear about, you know, maybe crypto zoo and stuff like that that's mm -hmm. been yeah. coming out. And that's even FTX. Yeah. FTX, yeah. That was a right? huge bummer to it was the a big entire space. That was a bummer for sure. And maybe I'm just a little jaded <sighs> and chewed up and spit out a little bit and have been on too many Twitter spaces. <laughs> totally. But I Lord knows we've all been on too yes, many Twitter. So and I'm like, many. do people <laughs> really want the space to be better? And what are they willing to yeah, do to yeah. make it better? Are you asking if they care about the bag or do they want the space to Both. succeed? Yeah. yeah. Both. So it's a really interesting question and it's a really good one. And it, it, it honestly comes to the core of why we even started NFT Now, because we actually started NFT Now to um, to fix a problem that we were experiencing in the space, which was a lack of credible resources. And so I remember, like, like you said, like that when that light bulb goes on, like, like you can't unsee it and you're like trying to share it with everyone. And I remember like trying to explain to all my friends about NFTs and I was like trying to send them articles and stuff. And like the only things I could really find were like, it was a lot of like platforms that like were also kind of like using it to promote their own drops. And then there were a lot of like talking head influencers shilling their own bags. Yep. Right. And so yeah. like, I was like, yo, like where's the credible coverage of the space? Where are the guides, the resources, where's the billboard, where's the complex of web three? It didn't exist. So we built it. And that's what like it was all about was like being able to create these credible resources and like I always say the mission of NFT now has stayed the same from day one, which is to empower the creators of culture and to take this technology from niche to mainstream. And the last part is really critical because we're not content to just like preach to the crypto native choir. We want to convert the masses. Exactly. And, by, and by doing that, we also need to make sure that they're protected. We need to also make sure that they are coming in in a credible way. We need to understand that like there are people that are, uh, there are bad actors in the space that are trying to scam them. We need to make sure that they, that they like have warning about that. We need to understand wallet security. They need to know what, what, how to look for, for good projects, how not to. Like they need to understand this technology. One thing that's critical is like, I went through the crypto learning curve in 2013 back with Bitcoin, back when there were like no guardrails you know what i mean like it was the wild west and like you know you you couldn't trust it still it, feels like still, the wild yeah. West. You can't trust, imagine yeah. how like but the, probably way worse in 2013 oh man like you couldn't trust any of the platforms and like you know and so but there was a little bit of like a healthy paranoia that you developed then like the whole not your keys not your coins thing like people who followed that they didn't lose money in ftx because they didn't have anything on there like i i've never kept stuff on centralized platforms you know but like again I went through that in 2013. I still had to go through the NFT learning curve in 2020. And you know what? A lot of people are doing both at once and it is incredibly daunting. 
I'm not going to minimize it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like it's hard. It's a, it's a steep learning curve and it's quite unforgiving. You know, decentralization is a double-edged sword. There's no like customer support helpline for the Ethereum blockchain, right? True. Like and if you, if you, if you make the wrong move, if you get scanned, if you click the wrong link, like there, you, you don't get that back, you know? And that's, that that's tough. Like I, and you know, what was really interesting is like in 2016 to 18, like we saw the rise of ICOs and all that, the initial coin offerings. Right. Yes. And a lot of those ended up being scams. Right. And a lot of good people got burned by the space. You know, they lost money um, with some of those. And it, it actually, I think it set back mainstream adoption because a lot of people were like, oh, crypto, that's all scams. Right. And so like when NFTs started blowing up, I was like, I have seen this movie before. Like, the PFP projects are really similar in that regard, a lot of them, right? And so a lot of them were just cash grabs. A lot of them were like, they didn't have any like substance behind them. And I was really concerned that a lot of people were also going to be burned by it. And so like education is absolutely critical 100%. to that. And that's, that's one of the so reasons why. I'm so glad that you, you said, said that, that. because yeah. that is what we started our project with the intention of. We wanted to make a project where new people could come into our environment in our community and learn something, feel safe, feel supported, feel that they have the resources. People say in the NFT space, uh, what is it? It's your badge of honor to get scammed. Mm. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we need to stop that narrative to say getting scammed is just a part of earning your stripes. When real people cannot afford to lose yeah. money, we have enough True. time and experience to let people know how not to get scammed. Right. And yeah. also that's going to completely deter new people in mainstream adoption from happening. If that's a part of the process, we need to nix that and nip it and get it out of the space. It should not be a norm. Really with this entire space, education is so important. And we've talked about this a million times. No one gets educated on finances. No yeah. one talks even about in, it. Even in even outside of yeah. crypto. Yeah, right? totally. it's like, such an uncomfortable topic oh to God. talk about. Like, why the hell did I learn calculus? Like, why did why was calculus ever in my but brain? Not nobody nobody taught me how to do taxes. Exactly. Like your credit you know, score. Or yeah, like seriously. Credit practice. Yes. It's ridiculous. And like you said, it's like look look like the learning curve is real. Right? Like with with crypto and Web three. Like I don't sugarcoat it. Like I've watched those, like a lot of my friends like really struggle with it. And these are smart people, right? And like you know, it's like the, right now the issue is the usability, the UX. Like the, it isn't there, and so it's it's really there's a lot of friction to go from interested to onboard, you know? Yeah. No one wants to download three separate apps to yeah. get money into one wallet and then use that wallet and you have to connect your keys to a right. site that you don't know if you trust or not. Like there's just too many barriers to entry yeah. before mass adoption happens. Yeah. And actually, I have a question for you. What do you think it'll take for mass adoption to occur in the NFT space? To me, um, like one thing that we often talk about in like the NFT space is like NFT space having like its iPod moment. Um, cause the iPod moment was like where people stopped talking about the tech and they started talking about what the product could like do for them. Right. Like the iPod moment was when like Steve jobs was like, like however many, like five, however many thousand hundred songs in your, in your pocket. That's right? how they marketed it. It was like right. 500,000. 500, yeah, pocket, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and so like that makes sense to everyone. A lot of people don't care what an MP3 is. They don't care about the coding. They don't care about the technology. But like that was a game changer. As a music fan, I remember when that happened. I was like, holy shit. Like this is, you know, this is like a dream. Like all, all my music in my pocket. And so like the NFT in Web3 space has not yet had that moment. And, and that's okay. Like this is how this is how these things happen. Like it's how you we know, get there. It's how we get yep. there. Um, but you know, I think what's what's really interesting is like um, I, I think it, it, it's really going to come down to um, bringing communities into the space that for for whom this fits one of their like 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 consumer and creative priorities, right? Mm -hmm. um, like I, I thought it was really interesting. Um, like in one of the biggest like mass onboarding events for Web3 was uh, what Reddit launched NFTs, right? They Reddit digital collectibles, the digital avatars. And it's funny because like Reddit, like that community used to like hate NFTs, but all of a sudden like you launched it in a way that they understood, which is did avatars, like they've always, like avatars have been like popping on Reddit forever. Like avatars have always been important on Reddit, right? And all of a sudden you gave them the opportunity to own them and financial upside people change their tunes really quick, right? Because it already resonated. It resonated with the culture, resonated with their consumer priorities. And um, look, it, it, it's still TBD on how sustainable that will be and like whether whether it was like a flash in the pan or mm -hmm. whether it would like really lead to meaningful adoption, but it was definitely progress. And so like, I think more, more, um, more like, 
mass onboarding events like that. Um, I think gaming is going to be an absolutely critical driver of mainstream adoption. Oh, 100%. You know, yeah, it just makes so much sense. And what's funny is right now, the big gaming studios, they don't want it to happen. Like they're like, they're stirring up the pot, like trying to like encourage the anti NFT uh, narratives in that space, just because like they make way more money with their walled gardens than they'll make with like a composable. Fortnite, the yeah. amount of money Fortnite makes on skins and stuff like that. I play a little Fortnite and I went from like an Xbox to a PS4. Yeah. Had that be an NFT that I could transfer, that would make so much sense. Dog. But instead, I, I have to buy it all again. And yeah. they want that wa- that want barrier that. because there is not really mm-hmm. much of an incentive except for the piece that you were talking about earlier, which is having a direct line to your consumer, yeah. which is something that we realized. And when I was looking into the now pass, which I would love to get into yeah. as well, you know, one thing, an important thing I read on there, it said it will not happen overnight. Yeah. It will take time. Because people expect things to happen so quickly because you are building in real time. There has never been another time where you're marketing a product and the people that you're marketing to, your consumers, you're interacting on a Discord. They're on your Twitter space. They're giving you real-time feedback that as a team, you can implement that. This is the quickest process ever. But with that comes incredibly high expectations. And um, I think that that's like such a fascinating process part of the NFT space in general is the direct line to consumers. We've never seen something like this before. Well, right? everyone totally. expects everything now, nowadays, because everyone's attention spans has gone to down the shits ever since TikTok, ever since short form content has become popularized. No one can sit and listen other than podcasts being outside of the norm. People don't watch 20 minute videos on YouTube anymore. Yeah. It's 30 second videos on TikTok. So everyone wants everything now. And if they don't get it now, they lose interest. I mean, well, we- well the only distinction I'm making with that is like, for example, if I buy shoes on Nike, mm-hmm. I'm not expecting that I'm going to uh, all of a sudden like, reach out to them and get a complete uh, direct response and they're going to go change something about the shoe the next week. Yeah. So the expectation is, is different with NFTs than it is typical brands. Um, You can see it with like shipping. So I, I feel like with Nike, it would be like you would email someone after not getting your shoes in two days. Like everyone's attention spans has just like gone to shit because it used to be you waited a week to get your package and that was yeah completely normal. Yeah. And then Amazon... <laughs> fixed it or fixed it over for everyone else. <laughs> I can't tell which one it is. It's just like such a weird, weird place to be in where you feel like everyone's against you in a way when you have an NFT project. So I'm mm. curious what your experience is like because you're launching in a couple of days from yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. We are, well, look, look, but about everyone wanting everything now, you know, we did not name it NFT later, right? <laughs> 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 but, you know, I, I think this is a very fast paced space, right? I always say like yeah. Web3 moves fast, weeks or months, months or years, right? And that's why we were very, very, um, uh, what's the word straightforward to make people understand like so uh, the the now network which is the like all of the foundation that we're building for the future of tokenized media will not be built overnight it mm-hmm. will be built over time the now pass that we're launching is the access pass to the now network we're big believers that the web 2 media model is broken and um, you know I, I can I can tell you a little bit about why yeah. um, you know I, I think We'd that love to hear 100%. yeah it's like so look like with the rise of social media we saw a trend which was like all of a sudden this explosion in traffic to media publisher sites, right? Like they're through social media, they were getting more traffic than they'd ever had before. Um, but with that, it kind of came a price. And so um, because of that, these media platforms became addicted to that traffic and they started to tailor their coverage to fit those algorithms. So and false so, news. Yeah, well, th- that's, that's part of it. And yeah. so like, here's the thing is like, so what, what did that lead to? Um, it led to this clickbait race to the bottom that we see, right? There's a reason why like, you, I mean, we all know what like does well, right? On on uh, on Twitter, like, there's a reason why everyone's shit posting on Twitter, right? Because those sensationalist like hooks, those headlines, that clickbait, that that does well on those algorithms, right? Um, and so like you know, this led to a rise in like sensationalist headlines. This led to that like quick figure on the trigger. Everybody's trying to be first, right? So they can go viral, and that also led to some media organizations publishing things with inaccurate facts that they had to walk back, which hurt their credibility. And you know, it became this whole thing about like. Like it, it really has led to an erosion in trust in credibility. In fact, like polls are, are showing that uh, public trust in the media is at an all time low. Um, and that's a part of that. Uh, the other thing is that what's important to understand, too, is that the business model that fueled this 
programmatic advertisement. For, for those who don't know, programmatic ads are those like annoying banner ads that like pop up on all those sites. You probably use, if you use an ad blocker, you might not, you it's might like be- when you yeah. when you're looking for a recipe for apple pie, it's, it's like, like a yeah. million ads before yeah. you get to the recipe. Right, and so like that's programmatic ads. And so the way that, that they work is really simple. The more people that see it, the more impressions they get, the more, um, the more money that the platform gets. And so what this created was a perverse incentive for media companies to optimize purely for traffic like one metric. We all got boiled down to one metric, which is traffic. It was all about how many eyeballs can you get? doesn't matter who those eyeballs are. doesn't matter where they are. doesn't, doesn't matter like, you know, the quality. Uh, the quality, right? It became audience scale over audience depth. And this, this has led to, um, you know, these really misaligned incentives where uh, all of a sudden, you know, media companies care more about their advertisers than they really do care about their audiences. And they're, they're putting out content to game algorithms, whether it's Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, et cetera, um, in order to like, to just to, to, to monetize the f out of your eyeballs, you yeah. know, <laughs> and like, and, and then discard them essentially. And it's a super short sighted and it's also quite like shallow and a transactional one way street of information. And that kind of goes contrary to the whole like vision that like came with publishing and media of like the town, the town square of like, you know, and like, and the marketplace of ideas and like having a lot of voices in the mix. And that's also turned to these more siloed as the, al as the if you, if you have an algorithm, that's just going to show you what you want to see. That's how you get these echo chambers. That's mm -hmm. how you get the fake news and things like that. Um, and then finally, like violations of privacy because, um, Sites started, you know, tracking their users like really sophisticated ad tech in order to serve more ads to your users. And uh, obviously a lot of like, you know, terms and conditions that people just click, but like there's, you know, like real violations of privacy. And so what, what's what's interesting is even before now pass or, or now network, you know, we have always wanted to do it differently. So from day one on NFTnow.com, uh, we've never had programmatic advertisement. Like we don't do it. So how do, how are you guys making money? I'll tell you. And one thing I also want to say is in addition to not doing programmatic ads, uh, we, we don't track our users. Like we don't do private, we don't do pixels. We don't do cookies. Interesting. Yeah. We believe privacy is a fundamental right. And so, um, we've done, That's amazing. you know, so over the past two, our two years, we've done $4.1 million in top line revenue. Quick Sorry. little round of applause. That's amazing. <laughs> Moment of silence. <laughs> And a lot of it largely partnerships, but you know, we set a really high bar. Um, we, we said, you know, we, we actually left high seven figures in revenue on the table during the bull run because it would have cost us our credibility. A lot of really terrible projects were trying to throw a lot of money at us for promotion. Well, you did the coverage. right thing. I mean, yeah. see, look what happened with the- Logan Paul, Kim Kardashian. Totally. But just NFT, the handle on Instagram, oh, the yeah. platform that was being built yeah. And who, who was invested in that? Mark Cuban, Mark right? Mark Cuban was yeah. an yes. investor, but yeah. 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 I mean, they, they were, no, so everybody that they were saying yes to, we were saying no to. And, uh, and here you are sitting here today, continuing to evolve and build the platform and sadly, FTC guidelines. You don't fuck with that. No. So we said no to like everyone at the beginning. We finally said yes. The first people we said yes to for partner content was Coinbase and United Masters. Like that's the level wow. of the, that's the level of the bar we set. And that like really set the tone for everything. We we always say like at NFT now we're really about it's not about transactional partnerships, it's about transformational partnerships. We think like really long term engagements and like and across like a lot of different things. And like, we don't do like one offs. We don't sell social posts. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it has to be something that, that we really think is worthy of coverage. And what was really special too was that um that, that partnered piece that we did with Coinbase United Masters, it was like the top music NFT moments of, I think it was 2021 at that point, or maybe it was 2022. And then we ended up turning into like, you know, of all time. But it was a straight up like, like it was just a really great editorial piece that like we probably would have wanted to, to write anyway. Um, you know, so it, it was it, very organic. Yeah, it was very organic and it was just presented by them. And like, and it, it did really well. A lot of people shared it and obviously they got a lot of, they got a, a great reach and a great, like a great brand alignment with it. Um, but it was like, it's really different than like, just like a, like a fluff piece or something like that. And so there's ways you can do partnership that I think uh, like are authentic and can still be revenue driving. Um, and we've also done a ton in terms of events. So like, you know, we have uh, one of our, our flagship event is the the gateway and so the gateway we've done it uh at miami basel um the past was two years Christie's, right yeah exactly i think i saw it there you go good memory and uh we made we did it much bigger uh like this past year so we did it uh it was a five-day web three arts and culture festival uh we took over two city blocks uh 
12 buildings downtown. Wow. Uh, partnered with Mana Common and MoonPay. And we had amazing, amazing partners come through, like, uh, that activated, like, um, I don't, I don't want to miss anybody, but like Art Blocks and G Money's uh, 90CC and Artifact and Porsche wow. and like, wow. and um, Instagram. And like, you know, we, it was a good mix of like Web Phase Clan. Like, it was a mix of like Web 2, Web 3, um, and all across the board. And it was about really bringing the digital and physical worlds together, right? And so, um, so it, it, it's been really special. And so, like, actually, um, you know, as we think about it, it's like, how do we pioneer like a better media model, right? Like, how do we do a community centric media model? Well, in Web 2, it was all about audience, right? And so, like, in Web 2, people and, you know, media companies, creators, they would cre they would build audience as a means to an end, right? It would be a means to an end so you can monetize indirectly as a middleman for brands, right? Mm -hmm. That's the that's the ad, programmatic ad model for media companies. It's the, you know, creator model, the influencer model on Instagram yeah. and TikTok. And look, nothing wrong with it. Like, I respect the hustle. The likes and comments economy was all anyone had for a while, right? Yeah. But in Web 3, there's a better way. Um, because now, all of a sudden, and you can actually, instead of building audience, you can build community and you can build community as an end in itself. So you can directly monetize in a real digital asset economy uh, by creating value and then sharing in it with your community, creating value for your community and sharing in that value you're creating. And we're like, wow, how do we apply that to the media uh, world? And that's uh, that's how we get to like the now network and the now pass. I always say Web3 rewards those who show up, right? And so like one of the things that's really important for us is like we're basically going to build out these like reward mechanisms where like our community members can actually like um, earn rewards by like by uh, like Showing engaging, yeah, like like engaging with our content, sharing our content, contributing to NFT now. I see why you guys are doing it because you don't have programmatic ads, but when you guys are selling partnerships with advertisers, mm -hmm. you you're gonna in increase the number of eyeballs if you're rewarding people for engaging. And what we can also do is by like rewarding people for engaging, um, it becomes not a one way street. In fact, it becomes more than a two-way street. It almost becomes like a roundabout where everyone's together and like we create these like they, like like community like one of the best the best communities in Web three like create their own sub communities and like mm -hmm. their own like areas. Like we've seen this with like so many of the of the of the communities out there and like you know like we want to empower that. We want to empower like build out a whole creator and contributor network where people can actually share in the value they're creating. One of the things that we saw with the rise of programmatic ads is that because everybody was trying to set to game the same algorithms, a lot of coverage became really homogenous. Like and then readers. And an audience became loyal to the headline, not the brand. There was no reason to share like this publication versus this publication because, you know, at the end of the day, they were kind of interchangeable and you don't have a stake in any of them. Um, that's the difference between audience and community. Like we're talking about audience is aware that you exist audience. They might follow you. They may uh, click. They may like. They may even buy your products. Mm -hmm. They may. They may even. You know. But but at the end of the day, it's a one way street of of exchange. Whereas community, they want to win together. And in, in Web three, community actually has a stake in the game. We talked about this with the music, like like shareholders. It's the difference between being a fan and a shareholder, right? And so we want to empower our community members to have to like to really be to have a stake in 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 what we're building at NFT now. Also, we're going to be um, employing something called progressive decentralization centralization to actually start to open up some of our like our, our curated content series because like at the end of the day like what what I love about web3 and what like got us excited about it is the ability to like move beyond some of the like traditional entrenched hierarchies and gatekeepers and the like and so the last thing that we want to do is just like be the new gatekeepers mm -hmm. like that's not why we got into it I love that you said that I even made a tweet about this many months ago as an artist I felt the music web3 space was heavily gatekept yeah yes. it was really hard for artists that maybe don't have the recognition or the audience or the fan base yet, or maybe the connections to some of the people that are making these decisions, whether it's at sound, whether it's at, you know, these other platforms, no one, yeah. nobody does it intentionally, right? Oh. Like I'm not, I'm not saying that it just some felt, people gatekeep intentionally. Yeah, some yeah people no, do. I think people do, but it's not an easy thing to figure out as an artist. And I do think that there is so much low hanging fruit yeah. for musicians to utilize blockchain technology. There's so much clutter around it that it feels like it needs to be really cleaned up because all artists want to engage and all artists are incentivized more than any other business. It feels like to build a community of people totally. that give feedback, talk about it. Yeah. I mean, look, like what we're building is the future of tokenized media. And I think one thing that's really critical too is, um, you know, it, it's, it is thinking about um, as, as we look to the future, it's like, you know, 
what what does what does the future of like content consumption was the future of, of content ownership look like and the future of digital ownership and one thing i love to say is like we are all part of the last generations to grow up without digital ownership from day one the the kids who are going to be growing up the future generations to come are going to grow up owning things digitally they're going to own things physically they're going to accept them both for their own unique strengths and appeals they're not going to be like right click save or yeah. how do i hang it on my wall like they're not going to have those same hang ups that a lot of the generations like that like the previous generations do we're already seeing this with gen z and fortnite and roblox and yep. all of that they're just gonna say. they're already living digitally yeah you my know? niece and my nephew i remember they were spending money on their avatar like their skins when they were playing video games and i was like i would have never done that i i use napster i use limewire i got things for free and like hijacked them and stole them i never actually paid for anything yeah. digitally well think about this way like do you spend more time looking at your phone or your walls i'm communicating with my family 98 percent of the time through a digital format whether it be the phone whether it be you know zoom all these other places so our world has shifted so much more to our digital identity matters so much more than the physical world. I mean, as a creator, I totally understand that because I have formed this character of myself because even though I vlog and I make content around my own life, I still feel like I have to put on a show. I feel like I have to put on this identity that isn't 100% me, which is why I feel so much more relaxed in myself on a podcast because mm. it's not so much about who I am as a creator, what my interests are in beauty and fashion because that's not all I'm interested in, yeah. but it's what I've had to create to get sponsorships, to get those yeah. ad advertisers to work with me. It's the Web2 game. Yes, but I do have a question. Do you not think there's any healthy way for NFT now to take part in programmatic ads? Um, not programmatic ads, no. I, I think that we we certainly, like like I said, we do partnerships, which, are, mm -hmm. which is a form of advertisement. But yeah. I think programmatic ads, it's just, we don't want to open, we want to leave that shit in web two. You okay. know, like we just think that that the issue with programmatic ads is they lead to misaligned incentives where all of a sudden, like that becomes the driving force for your business. And it, 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 it encourages the kind of relationships that, that we are trying to avoid, you know? And so uh, it's, it's also a bit of a principled thing, okay. you know, like, yeah, there, is there a happy medium perhaps where like, you know, we could like work with like a specific ad, like, you know, uh, you know, network or something like that. Sure. But like, I would much rather like not do half measures and just innovate. Like, like what does the future look like? Because I don't think the future looks like that. Yeah. It's your identity yeah. too, which yeah. is so important. So if you are taking that on, it's doing way more damage to the identity of mm -hmm. your ethos rather than yeah. finding a way where it makes sense. I guess I'm only asking this because for me as a YouTuber, like I'm not yeah, yeah. entirely sure if you're fully aware what I do. I would rather have programmatic ads being my full-time income than sponsorships because I feel like with sponsorships, I can't be completely honest about say if I loved my sh meal from McDonald's or not, do I feel healthy eating it afterwards or not? I, I feel like I have to be a little bit more um, forgiving towards those brands I work with versus programmatic ads. I have no say what runs. I can say no to the ads, but for the most part, Google AdSense. So for me, it's like I'm not shoving any sort of brand down anyone's throat. What if what if you didn't have to rely on either of those? <laughs> I, I would have say. loved. I would love there that. You go. That's, that's the, the, that's the, the promise. That's the promise of Web3 and that's the promise of tokenized media. Yeah, that's actually a really, really great, um, you know opinion to have so to do, how do we yeah. get there and what does it look like yeah yeah well look it's, it's not like i said it's not gonna happen overnight right yeah and totally. so um, no but but look and, and i want to make also really clear like in no way am i demonizing like the creators who are who are like part of the, this because like i get it like mm -hmm. so many of the of the greatest uh artists and creators in the web two, in the web three space started out in web two they built like like for example like photographers like like swopes and like dave krugman like they built like big instagram followings and they were able to get sponsorship and partnerships that felt right you know with like with the you know like like swopes is the face of adobe that's dope mm -hmm. right and it's like like there's nothing wrong with that that's awesome actually but how how powerful is it to be able to like make a make a living off your own creative vision and without necessarily having to even like have have the brands involved right mm -hmm. and for most for most creators it's going to be a mix of both like you have to meet the market where it is right like there's we're, we're like going full-blown web three most people are like like web 2.0 to a web zone 2.3 at best, right? Yeah. And that's okay. Like these things do take time. But for us, it's about it's about pioneering this. So for us, it's about being like, yo, we know this is the future. We're skating to where the puck is going. And if I told you, for example, that we had it all figured out, that would be really disingenuous. You oh, know? yeah. 100%. Yeah. And, and it would also be short sighted because at the end of the day, the space moves so quickly, the technology evolves so quickly. Um, that like if you if you're like, yo, 
I know exactly what this looks like in five years, you're you're probably missing something because uh, like there's uh, like a new a new tech product could come out tomorrow night that totally changes how we're thinking about mm -hmm. it in a great way. But like there's so one of the things that's also important is like, you know, we talked about all the noise right in the space. Like we've always like our mantra has always been like be the signal and the noise, right? Um, be that trusted source, that number one trusted source. And so the artwork is actually inspired by that concept of being the signal and the noise. And there's actually like some really, really cool mechanics where like we can actually like send signals to these through the metadata oh, wow, and stuff wow, like that. That's so and cool. that's that's actually some alpha. I haven't really like we haven't <laughs> really <laughs> talked about that. Uh, we've we've you hinted heard at that. Rotten first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've, we've hinted at that, but like what we're doing, quite honestly, has not been done before. Yeah. And I'm not saying that just to, to like hype it. It's just like it, it's like uncharted territory when you're, mm -hmm. you know, like we're not we're not at the cutting edge. We're cutting the edge, you know, and like I love and that. That's, and it's really exciting. Yeah. It's also like we may not get it right all the time. You know, and that's okay. That's part of being a pioneer. We went through that with our mystery trunks. Yes. I, I, I urge anyone who's listening to this to be like super empathetic to project founders in the space because it's like, it's it's intense. There's a lot of moving parts that come with these launches. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things to think through. There's a lot of there's, expectations. There, yeah, there's a lot well. of expectations. And like, and the mental health element is real. You know, and I've spoken- It's I've, so real. Back to your point about it's not going to happen overnight. That's what we stood on from day one when we were launching our project. Hey guys- we want to build something that's actually going to last. And our skill sets do lie within Web 2. This is all new uncharted territory. And we do want to bring new people in. So launching this podcast was one of the ways in which we were continuing to expand the brand and the IP, letting people know, hey, we don't know what five years down the road yeah. is going to look like, but we're going to be building this. It might not look how you think it's going to look. It's not like, but that is sort of what we need that's to instill in it. people. Because not only does it, ruin good projects, but it doesn't allow people to build and actually build something of value that's tangible because as a community, I think that we really need to instill that patience. And I love that. I, you know, when I was reading on your site, it was like, this will not happen overnight Yeah, it's because people expect it to. And I think we need to identify the difference between people who want to just make money and the difference between people who really do want to build because they're, it's kind of like everyone's grouped into one pool but there is such a difference between those two incentives. Right. I mean, I can see it just by talking to you that you, you know, you are going to make money from it, but that's not really your incentive or goal with NFT now because you have been leaving money on the table with saying no to that seven figure yeah. deal. Yeah. We're, we're, Can right, I ask how, how, so it, was it, it wasn't even like a seven figure deal. It was like, it was just like the aggregate of just every, all of these projects trying to throw money at oh, us. And we oh, kept, okay. and we kept track of, we kept track of like, you, Do you know, know the, how much well, it was cumulative. Uh, um, I, I, it was definitely like upwards of like eight or 9 million, I think. Oh, um, wow. And I remember like there was a project that tried to pay us 250 K for a tweet and like, which is crazy, right? That's for crazy. a tweet, but but it like if we did it, it just would have been it would have been selling out our credibility. And I can tell you, our credibility is worth a lot more than eight or nine million dollars, right? Like yes. our credibility is priceless. That authenticity is priceless. You spent two years building trust and credibility in the space. Like we're not going to throw that away. We have a responsibility to our community to like to ensure that what we're putting in front of them is is accurate and legitimate and and is actually intended to create value for them. I love that you have such a high moral compass. I want to know a little bit about your backstory because for most people, they wouldn't one be able to afford to have this high of a moral compass, right? Because saying no to nine million dollars when you're a small startup, two years yeah. in the in the making, wasn't is easy. impossible. Yeah. That's the difference. It's like we 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 play long. Like are we have a saying like we play long term games with long term mm -hmm. people. We're in this for the long term. We're thinking really big. You know, it, this is not just like a, a little flash in the pan to us. This is this is like the rise of, of NFTs and Web3, um, this the, what this is doing with the creator economy, like this is going to fundamentally, I think, shift and 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 define how creators and their communities create and share value together, right? This makes me so curious to know like what you are like as a child. <laughs> uh, I was the poster child for ADHD. I was ah. like, I was the, I was super hyperactive. I was like, you know, bouncing around. I had boundless energy. You know, I needed like, I would, when I would go out to like, to restaurants and stuff, I would have, I'd have two books, like one for each hand. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> just reading yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. No, I was like, I was, I was like that kid. You know what I mean? And I told you, my, my dad was a, a brain doctor, a neurologist. My mom is a nurse and genetic Did counselor. Did he notice? I was right diagnosed away? at like, like, I was diagnosed in like, like preschool. You know what I mean? Like, um, but you know what? Like, that's also like, I think it's a blessing because like people with ADHD, actually are like some of the most creative people on earth um and so like you know for me it, it's actually it there's like part of that is like what drives the creativity of it so i feel like nowadays it is so um common to have adhd because i actually got diagnosed last year matt's mm -hmm. been diagnosed as well but 
Squad, let's go. <laughs> let's go, ADHD yeah. squad. New, new squad name, guys? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> um, but for me, I, I um, it looks so different in different people because I don't yeah. have that hyper, hyperactivity. I think I just believe. Oh, I just believe, got the Ds. The I ADD, just got the Ds. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so for me, like I was a high functioning, did really well as a yeah, student, yeah. Um, was valedictorian, went to UCLA, studied business. Yep. Um, and for me, it, it only started occurring to me over the last few years because of like the little things that I did that mm. I noticed I have ADHD. And I just learned this. Do you have ADHD morning anger? Morning anger. I don't uh, know about that. What is I've it? never heard about this either. I just, okay. This so I, this is why I love TikTok and this is why I would absolutely mm. hate it if TikTok was ever banned. There is this thing called morning anger and ADHD people where okay. the first 30 minutes they're awake, they're just angry at the world. They don't want to do anything. Mm. Um, and they want to be by themselves. I almost feel like nowadays anyone can say they have ADHD because there are so many symptoms that apply to people nowadays yeah. that it's like, I mean, it's definitely overdiagnosed for sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's why Adderall, is oh, at yeah. uh like <laughs> there's like, a shortage of Adderall right exactly. now. But I, I I'll say that. this: I don't get the I don't have morning anger. Um, I'm really <laughs> fortunate. I actually practice gratitude in the morning. Oh, that, um, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why. But I will say that like my mornings are like I want I I need a period of my mornings for myself. Like I need like yeah, time to like same. meditate, w like work out. But if you like, don't get that, do I, you get angry? It's not well. It, anger may not be the right word, but it definitely it definitely um it it. It uh it impacts the rest of my day for okay. sure. Like when there are when there are days where I'm not able to like do my routine, like work out, uh, meditate, like all of that. Like I feel it all day. You guys I'm more on so edge. Similar. Yeah. We. I mean, we've yeah. been talking about this a lot because I'm a very structure. structured person. She yeah. is the complete opposite. Yeah. So when I don't have my structure, it's like you said, it's just not optimal, and it it just creates a little bit more anxiety. I feel yeah. like I'm off. It's like I need to check the things off. I went on a walk. I yeah, spent yeah. time without my phone. I you know, was able to work out for me, at least I find so much fulfillment in yep. structure, in routine, in taking time for gratitude. Like every morning I wake up and I spend the first 15 minutes free writing, just whatever's yeah, coming yeah, out. Great. And I always end that with my mantras and then I'll follow that into the list of the day. Yeah. So it's like a good flow. Maybe I should to, practice that so should. I don't get morning anger. Well, morning. you know, one, one thing to know, as I said, my dad's a, a brain doctor. So like one of the things he told me that really resonated with me is that actually like the, the like right after you wake up mm -hmm. is when your brain is at its like most plastic, like, like kind of like free form creative state, like, and mm -hmm. uh, it's actually the most impressionable state. It's like, you're, that's kind of like this magic hour and most people waste it immediately because they reach for their phone and they waste that period by, by just taking in everybody else's shit. Like yep. every, like whether it's text, whether it's other posts other like that, rather than letting their stuff come mm -hmm. out. And so like, actually like when I, you know, it, it's hard sometimes in web three when there's so much happening and when we have big launches like now pass and things like that. But like, um, you know what, when in a perfect world, what I like to do is also free, write Because, um, you're at your most creative, like pure state of mind the minute you wake up. And, uh, what I don't like to do is like waste that brain, that, that mental state on like just other people's things that they've put out into the world. You know, I want to, I want to keep that for myself. You know what I found <laughs> through doing the free writing because I made a very, yeah. very intentional starting the year that I was going to commit to that every morning. There are of course mornings I can't, but 90% of the mornings I do it. And, um, I don't do first 30 minutes, no phone. Like I will not to look at emails. I don't yeah. even look at text because I don't want those thoughts to start happening because I, really hone in on this time to like get my thoughts out and you start talking about like oh the weather things and then all of a sudden you start you realize you start writing about things that are really like deeply inside like oh this thing happened yesterday it made me feel this type of way yeah and then you're starting to have all these revelations and realizations about your work and about life and about your feelings and it's just really helpful in becoming way more in tune or at least i found it for myself i've been able to be way more in tune and present when I'm able to spend the time to like dig what's going on and, and learn so many things throughout that process, especially with the process of making music. There's so it's so it's such a fine tuning game where you have to spend so much energy yeah. just devoting to the process. And that can be very difficult. So you just learn a lot if you're willing to take the time like, hey, I actually I was I felt really good you know, for example, maybe for you, like I felt really good when I got my edit done yeah. at 9 p.m. versus the next 3 day. <laughs> Let me like, let's take some time to think about like, I felt good there. Let me, how can I continue to follow fulfillment, which has mm. been my sort of path. I love that, this year. you know, uh, not a lot of men talk about free writing or taking yeah. time to, you know, look 
inward. So I, I'm very impressed that, you know, you do that and are more open about talking about it. I mean, like, you know, just like mindfulness in general, you know, like there shouldn't be a stigma about it. Like mental health is real, you know, like I, I always say like, like journalizing is, is a ama- is a very, very powerful practice because mm-hmm. it allows you to really like, like it's a way of actually, um, like addressing, like hearing out and like internalizing and and moving forward from different thoughts and feelings you're having. And sometimes if you don't lay them out, you actually don't know why you're feeling a certain way, you know? And like, I've often found that like, there was like a nagging feeling that was, and then the minute I like carved out time to just like actually write down why I'm feeling that way, that feeling disappeared. Like I was still aware of it, like mm-hmm. I'd recognized it, mm-hmm. but like it was no longer like bothering me because I had like given it the attention it deserved. And I had actually thought it through and understood why I was feeling that way. When other times, like you may feel things that are real, but may not be true, you know, like mm-hmm. that's possible. I've found that it's been helpful for me once you do it enough and you're starting to take note of your feelings and getting more in tune with yourself, you become way more present with your feelings and you're able to extract more when things come up because you've kind of dug out everything. Right. But if you're constantly having things pile inside emotionally that you're not processing or dealing with, then one thing could trigger you, but you could be triggered a different emotion. You don't know what you're exactly feeling. So I found that it's helpful to actually understand exactly what you're feeling yeah. when things arise. So you I can mean, for address me, it. For me, uh, I know we're going on a complete tangent here. I wasn't used to talking about my emotions just because of the way I grew up in mm. the culture that I live. I'm, you know, first generation in the U.S. My parents were immigrants, escaped China and Vietnam from communism, came here. And so for them, it's like, what do you mean your life is hard? What, what do you have to complain about? I literally dug my own grave and you are sitting here in your house complaining about being hungry for like two hours like what do you mean um and so like when i met you you were probably the first guy i dated that was very emotionally intelligent and wanted to talk about your feelings and that's very rare to find yeah we need more of that yeah Yeah. more of that yeah we spent like a whole episode last week talking about just like the relationship in society in society right now it's a very confusing time honestly to be a man um of many things right But it's the first time that I'm starting to hear men talk about being a little bit confused with masculinity, Mm -hmm. right? The relationship around masculinity, it almost sounds negative talking about it. We just talked about this because I was ultimately saying that I think men really need to do a better job and step up um, and support each other Mm -hmm. because women by nature support each other, you know, but, but men are so it's a dog eat dog world the way that we've evolved from surviving where we don't really check in on each other. We don't, it's, it's almost like, Hey, you're a man, you take care of your thing. Mm. And that's why we see such a high rate of suicide among men in, later on in life because they have nowhere to turn. They don't, ha- they don't feel people understand them. And then when, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like there's just a, there's a stigma around that. And, and it's one of the things that we've actually been like, when we think about like mental health at large, um, it's one of the things that we've been really vocal about at NFT now. Like I always say that like the NFT space, for example, is heading for a mental health crisis Oh, yes. because it's literally 24 seven markets that do not respect weekends. They do not respect holidays. Like they, it's, it's always on. And, uh, uh, it's life changing like sums of wealth that are getting won and lost <laughs> overnight, you know, um, and there's the FOMO, there's the regret, there's the the dark side of the roller coaster. There's not like, to mention these are yeah. all uh, the way that it is. It's a lot of it is anonymous. You don't know who people are. Trolling. So Twitter yeah. makes for that a very unhealthy and toxic environment when people are just saying things, trying to get a reaction by saying something oh, yeah. wild. Now don't you don't feed the <clears> trolls <throat> and they have and they don't have to show their face. It's like you wouldn't say these things in real life, but you've but you're finding that you can say them on Twitter because there will be no repercussion from you saying whatever. I mean, so for you, you know, having like a neurologist dad, (laughs) I can't imagine the conversations you would have if you ever felt like something was going on with you. It it. It, it wasn't necessarily like like uh, psychology, right? Okay, Where it's like, right. yeah, so it was he was it's more like what, what he would focus on is kind of like um, like 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 neural disorders, like like multiple sclerosis or like Alzheimer's or things like oh. that. So he's approaching it more from like a clinical kind of like a, that side of it. Um, but but that said, I mean, like definitely like growing up in a medical household, <laughs> like there was there are no shortage of, of medicine. As I said, I was diagnosed like with ADHD super early on. Right. And medicated, which is a whole nother thing to like, you know, go through and to understand and to come yep. to terms with. Were you so on riddles? It was Ritalin, Ritalin when I was growing up, and then I switched to Adderall after that. And uh, look, it's like there's there's um, it there's there's a there's a 
like there are pros and cons associated with with that, right? Like there are definitely good things. Like I don't know if I would have been as successful in school without it, you know. But also, nobody ever gives you like a user's guide to growing up with ADHD and high powered amphetamines in your system, right? You kind of have yeah. to figure it out on your own, especially in the pre internet like the real pre internet era for adolescents. Like like at least like nowadays, you could go on like a site and like at least like find forums and like talk to people who are going through the same thing. But like that didn't really exist in my childhood, right? Especially when you're a four. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. You were saying that there is, we're headed for a mental health crisis yeah. in web three. Yeah. How do we, well, how that? do we, yeah. What do we do? Like what can be done? Is there anything? Yeah. Does it just need to Should run? Should we as implement like Saturdays and Sundays off? Like what do we do for the web three space in that it, sense? I think we just need to talk about it more. I think we need to like really uh, like destigmatize it. And like, I think we also need to like recognize that like it's okay not to be okay. And it's okay to like unplug. And you know what? Like it's something I always talk about is like the, like FOMO, the fear of missing out yes. is like the most powerful force in the space, both for, for good and for bad, for better and for worse. And like, you know, we had to talk a lot about Jomo, like the joy of missing out. It's like, you know what? Like, like I always say, like what I, what I think is important is that to approach like the web three space, uh, from an abundance mindset and to understand that like, there are so many opportunities ahead. So you should never like be held, like, ne like you should never be hung up on like something you missed or like a, or something you did wrong. Like every, every like learning lesson, every, every, everything is an opportunity to learn. Right. And so like, you know, just like, like just getting more positive narratives out there. I think like, like it was really interesting, like speaking really candidly about mental health. I was really like heartened by the amount of people that like reached out to me um, to be like, yes, thank you for saying this because it's something I've been feeling, but they didn't feel like they could say it because it would be like showing weakness or some of these things that you know, like we, we kind of talked about these stigmas and it's like, no, like let's be real about it. Like here's the thing is like, like, a lot of people aren't built for the crazy roller coaster ride that is like the crypto and NFT space. And nobody's built for it all the time, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't turn off. So you have to actually self-regulate that. You have to be the one to be like, you know what? I'm cool, like unplugging for, for a weekend. You know what? I'm, I'm okay with potentially missing out on this thing. Uh, and you know what? It's like, that's, that's okay. That's okay. And like, it, it, it I think also, um, one thing we have to also be really cognizant of is the fact that like, um, this is, uh, you know, this, this was my third crypto cycle, right? I started like dabbling That's in Bitcoin crazy. in 2013. You're like a grandpa in this space. <laughs> totally, right? <laughs> Weeks or months, months or years, right? So, um, but like for a lot of, uh, like, you know, for a lot of people, especially in the creative industries, a lot of the artists and stuff, this was their first crypto cycle, right? And so yeah. like one thing I have to always remember too is like when Bitcoin crashed in 2013, I didn't have conviction that it was coming back. I thought it was really cool. I believed that in the idea of the Bitcoin white paper, but I didn't necessarily like know in my like heart of hearts and in my bones that like this was the future and this is coming back. Like it could have just been a weird internet thing that popped off for a second. Lord knows there are plenty of those, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, but after 2016 to 18 and be like, oh, okay, we Ethereum, like I was onto something and all that. Then like with NFTs, I was like, I have seen this movie before. I know how it ends. But again, like things people don't tell you. Nobody tells you necessarily. Like, you have to learn for yourself. Like, oh, like when you make a sale, a big sale in ETH, you should trans like you should uh convert a certain percentage of that that's gonna cover your tax burden to stable coins so USDC. that you can do USDC so that you can then cover your taxes. So you're not on the line for like some crazy tax bill when like your actual capital has gone far below that. It's like a lot of artists discovered that the 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 hard way right they learned that the, the hard way there was like a lot of toxic positivity around the space the whole wag me culture which yes. like you know like it and the, the reality is a market is like is that there is no wag me like we are all not going to make it that doesn't that's not how markets work right now do we all have the opportunity to potentially make it I'd say potentially like, like, you know, that this is a great equalizer. This is like it, for our generation, like our generation has gotten a lot of shoots and not many ladders. And like crypto is really one of those, right? It's an opportunity to like, you know, especially like, you know, with the, with the financial crisis and everything that's, you know, like that we've like, that we've lived through, right? Um, crypto can really like bring new people to the table. But at the end of the day, like, I think it's important to like, recognize that like we that, that's why that's why education like we recognize that like education is critical here like there are certain things and best practices and 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 narratives that we need to like there are narratives that need to stay and there are narratives that need to go and um you know i i think it's like it's been a real learning lesson for a lot of people but i'm i i'm concerned i'm definitely concerned about about the space and the health of the space and the health of artists and the health of creatives incredibly like sensitive people and like creative souls who are here and like dealing with this like this up and down as i said it's not for everyone it's not. And, and we've also never seen, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're obviously way more uh, experienced in this space, but we've never seen an NFT 
run ever. We've there's been crypto runs, right? But this is the first time culturally that there's ever been this amount of volume and sales and yeah. business and ecosystems being built around NFTs. So we don't know how those things will bounce back, right? Yeah. Because a lot of people invested in projects and were told that they would get things that they didn't get or see the value or, you know, so many projects just rugged and moved on. A lot of people got jaded by those false promises. So I wonder what the next NFT run is going to look like. Um, and I know for sure, regardless, what it will look like will be people like you leading the charge with good morals and wanting to make things better because the space does mature really quick. Yes. And we have saw that, like I said, with our project because of how much work it took in having to not only we wanted to be docs, we wanted to put out educational information, we wanted to start building like even this podcast and everything, we launched it before our project even went out to show people we're putting real money into this. Like we're not just playing around. Um, and even what we did, this is kind of a side tangent, but we realized like when we started our project, we talked to lawyers because we were going to go with a different brand. And then we talked to lawyers and they're like, you can't go with that because Warner Brothers owns something similar. It's mm -hmm. infringing on the IP. So we came up with something completely original and different. Um and we went through that process to invest and own the actual IP in the rights of our brand. And we found throughout that process that there's so many projects that haven't even done maybe that due yeah. diligence as far as owning the thing that they're claiming people own. Are you talking about DGen Tunes? No, I'm not talking about any project specifically, but I'm just saying there are so many peop projects infringing on copyrights that they don't own at all, which it's a lot of legal gray area. I mean, they always say, look like, you know, the, the law books are always like 10 to 15 years behind the technology, but in web three, that's like 10, 15 years, right? That's, that's like, that's, 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 centuries. that's centuries. That's centuries. I mean, did you yeah. hear the whole, um, uh, Meta Bergen's yeah, yeah. and how, uh, they Hermes, ended up, yeah. he had to settle at a court, I yeah, believe. And yeah. they lost the case yeah. against Hermes. Uh, Hermes. Yeah. yeah. And that was I mean, huge. as they should, right? That was huge. I mean, it sets, it that sets was a dangerous such a gray precedent, area, though. yeah. yeah. Model. I see yeah. the abundance mindset you have. Yeah. I can see it with you turning down deals and the fact that you're like, well, I've seen Bitcoin go down the shits twice, three mm -hmm. times now. Like, I know it's coming back. And that's a really healthy mindset to have. So yeah. I really commend you for that. Thank you. But again, it didn't happen overnight, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have to be patient. We have to remember that like for a lot of people who are in the NFT space, they're still in that first cycle mentality. You know, they're in that position where like, that was cool. I don't know if that's ever coming back. That was that like, is that, was that real? Or was that like just a, you know, a crazy, like, you know, response to like stimulus checks and hyperinflation and shit like that. You know what I mean? But it's like one thing that I know very fundamentally is that digital, digital ownership isn't going anywhere. Digital ownership is only going to get more and more important. And that's, that doesn't mean that like the NFT that you bought at the top of the bull market is going to necessarily come back. Depends on what that what that is. Mm -hmm. But NFTs are going to be an incredibly important part of the future. Without a doubt. I mean, you can just feel it. And like you're saying, it's not even about just a specific project, but there's no way you can undo this cultural yeah. movement of when things click and just make so much sense. We bought she bought concert tickets for us over the summer through Ticketmaster. What concert? It was Rest. Russ. At, oh yeah, uh, yeah, at Hollywood Bowl, and uh, they didn't. And StubHub like didn't send the tickets, and then there was a dispute between the sender, and oh, it was God. the day of. And then all of a sudden, she's on the phone with the customer service, and it's like, if this was an if NFT, this was an NFT, it would be so, so much, much more effective. Like, yeah. why do we have to go through this third party where there isn't a verification? Like, if you sell me a ticket, it should just go right to me, and I have that ownership. There should be no wait in the mail. Talk to customer service. It's just ridiculous. Have you tried making like a big bank transfer recently? It's the most ridiculous thing on earth to it go through. It takes days. Yeah, it was, it's so many you like have hoops. You sit and, like, in yeah. with your banker and so sign papers oh and God. do all this stuff. It's yeah, so, it's so clear. You're like, yo, like. Did you do that recently? Well, yeah, actually. Is it for like a house? What is it? What no, was it for? you know, it was uh, during the whole SVB. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> we need to talk about this. I cannot but, but, believe. But so on the uh, on the flip side of that, yeah. though, right? Yeah. Like that's also what keeps our money secure to a degree. So do people push back on you maybe from the outside that are like, hey, maybe decentralization isn't a good thing when clearly these things can happen when they're not in the right hands or they're offshore? Um. 
when we think about like some of the like the things that happened over the past year, like the fall of FTX and the like, a lot of people like tried to like use the fall of FTX to like demonize crypto. But if you think about it, like FTX was one centralized entity, one centralized exchange that was outside of the regulatory jurisdiction of the United States in the Bahamas. And like, if anything, the fall of FTX is should illustrate the importance of decentralization, right? Which is what this entire space is is undergirded by. So like one bad centralized actor, you know, like contributed to this, like I think really false narrative. Um, but that's just like part of the, that's like par for the course for this. Like there are always going to be bad actors to be shaken out. Whenever you're in, like, like I mean, look at the the the, the prolif like the, the advancement of the tech industry, right? Obviously, like whenever there's new opportunities, like bad actors will flock, right? And they'll get shaken out. And it's part, and it, and it can be painful for markets. It can be painful for the space, but ultimately it's a healthy thing for ecosystems. I'm, okay. So now, um, back to your wire transfer. Oh this yeah, crazy. yeah, yeah. No, we were, we were really fortunate. Um, so we, we were not at, we had no exposure to SVB. Um, but we did have, uh, we did have some funds on first Republic bank, which was a little bit on, crazy. on shaky footing. Um, and we, uh, one of our investors actually gave us a great tip, uh, in, in advance, uh, of, what did of he the say exactly? He that just, made you uh, understand. He, he just said, Hey, like, you know, look like, uh, I forgot the exact wording, but it was like, you know, you know, there's, there's some concern in the sector if you're like banking with some of these like you know regional banks um you may want to think about um like making a move and you know out of a out of a place of like of preventative hygiene and out of like you know wanting to just be like super safe and due diligence we we moved uh we moved those funds over to chase and it turned out to be a great decision so we really feel really fortunate about the timing uh Thank shout God out to, shout out to our investors shout yeah. out to our investors for looking out for us but um you know i think at the end of the day like what, what we recognize is that a lot of a lot of founders out there weren't as fortunate right and a lot of those like did luckily obviously with the Fed coming in to help, like you know, kind of like like make that situation a lot better. But yeah, it, it could have been dollar, all yeah, the deposits. It could, it could have been it could have been a lot worse. So yeah, I mean, I think luckily Congress had just um, came out saying that the FDIC would ensure everyone's mm -hmm. deposits, no matter the the amount. I I believe like Roblox is getting one hundred fifty million dollars, which is okay. beyond two hundred fifty k. Yeah, yeah. Just, just a little <laughs> beyond, a little just, beyond, just yeah. a tiny bit, a tiny bit. AI. Oh man, I love. I'm it. sure that Dude, this I'm, fits right oh within. God. With what you're building, because I love AI, I'm I'm having so much Chat fun GBT. with it. I'm doing ChatGPT into Midjourney and like back again and the like. Like it's so. Let me tell you why I love AI, um, and you'll you'll appreciate this as a musician. So for me, like I've always been a by ear musician, right? So I did play viola as a kid. I, I was not good, right? Like instruments have never mm -hmm. really been my thing. But I would hear melodies in my head and like I would struggle to get them out on instruments. Right. And so like, you know, for a long time, whenever I was like, because, you know, I produce music and the like, you know, what I would do is I'd like, like go through this laborious process of like trying to figure out what notes I was hearing in my head on a keyboard and be like, dun, dun. like I'd always hear these melodies. I would know they're in the right keys, but I couldn't tell you what keys. I couldn't tell you what notes. I just not like in like it, my, that's not the way my brain works with music theory or whatever. And so like I would go through this like painful process. And then finally, Ableton Live created audio to MIDI. And it was an yes. absolute game changer for my process because all of a sudden I would just sing the, the notes that were in my head and it would immediately do the notes. And it changed the game for me in terms of audio production. I feel like AI is doing that for my imagination in the sense that like, Ooh, I, yeah. like I've never been a great like painter or drawer or mm -hmm. like anything like that. I don't have that skill, right? But I have a very overactive imagination. You know, it's that AD, it's that H, <laughs> it's that H in the, in the ADHD. And, mm -hmm. and so like one thing that like, shout out to Claire Silver, who's an amazing, amazing AI artist in the NFT space. Um, she's a pioneer and, uh, we had her on the NFT now podcast and she actually like really said something that clicked with me. She was like, AI is, is a camera for the imagination. And all of a sudden you can now capture that. And as a writer myself, you know, I come from a creative writing background. Journalism is just one area of my writing, you know, and as a writer, as a, someone who actually loves descriptive writing, like being able to, to do descriptive writing is a superpower in AI. Like being able to describe what's in what yeah. you're seeing, like in words and, and, and tailor it for prompts and the like is incredibly powerful. And so like I have actually been finding like really like a lot of like creative inspiration and excitement um, in, in mid journey and, and GPT and like that combo together. I love that too. And, and also what I was curious and your thoughts about it with from a content perspective, yeah. right? Because they're able to, auto they're able to generate these voices you know you see all these viral pieces of content of trump and biden talking and stuff like that but That's it's going to get such to a point where it's literally going to be not distinguishable from reality yeah, versus ai where does is there blockchain technology that fits within that because i would there assume that the future of media is tokenized exactly where where right? does that video live 
it's, it, it, was it was it minted by a by a real source? Yep. Or open that, that, that's how we're going to be able to like that. Like there's there's different elements to tokenization of media. And one of them is going to be authenticity. 100 percent, because how we're, like that's where I'm thinking is that every piece of content is going to have to be verified. It's almost going to be like a built in function function like deep in the future. Right. I could see that being a thing. Everything that you record from your phone mm -hmm. has something that's built in so that there is no way. So it has you, like a little watermark on everything that you do. Yeah, or it's maybe in the back end or it's something, right? But because then there's going to be no other way to distinguish between reality and AI, right? Yeah, so I it's mean, gonna, Photoshop is so realistic already. I can't imagine video. Yeah, the, deep, the deep like, fakes are real. Deep yeah, fakes look so real. Yeah, but we could go on forever. We can go on next, forever. We'll, we'll, we'll like, yo, like, like part two, season two will be the AI combo. And like, yeah. Let's yeah. do it. We'll Let's see do how it. things evolve. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm things move so look, quick. I'm a futurist. Like I've, I've always like, like technology has always driven like creativity and storytelling and, and art forms forward. And like, this is all it's, it's, this is all like incredibly exciting and in some ways scary stuff, but, uh, I embrace it. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Like I could see the scary element of it, but imagine I content embrace. creators that are open AI, like you wouldn't know that it was a content creator that wasn't real, but it was a computer generated content creator mm -hmm. or maybe it's already starting someone's to yeah. already out there yeah. doing it yeah. yeah yeah should we do our am i rotten yeah all right so if you've never watched our podcast we end every single episode with a am i rotten submission okay have you heard of am i the asshole on reddit i actually haven't Tell okay me. so it's pretty Clue much a moral dilemma people mm -hmm. have and they'll submit it and it's all you like it's all of our viewers submitting this but i will read this out loud for you guys am i rotten for putting sugar in my then boyfriend's tank of gas what happens if you put sugar in gas i'm like i, I like failed chemistry i didn't actually fail but like i hated that i hated that subject you know? okay um well I'm, I'm pretty sure when you put sugar in a tank of gas it no longer works so this like, is just like simple sabotage of a moving vehicle yes. yeah i think that's pretty rotten actually <laughs> pretty, okay yeah. but here here then they give us the backstory <laughs> okay three years ago i was dating a guy let's call him joe we were together for about six months when i found out joe was actually cheating on me mm. We lived an hour away from each other and he was sleeping over when around 2 a.m. I noticed he was charging his Apple Watch and there were texts from numbers I didn't recognize. I started scrolling through all of the messages and of course it turns out he was sexting and cheating on me with a girl that lived in his town. I was so pissed reading all these texts that I knew we were 100% over. So what I did was I quietly snuck out of my apartment with my boyfriend's car keys and poured a whole pound of sugar down his tank of gas. After I was finished, I snuck back into my apartment, stood over my boyfriend and started shouting and screaming at him while shouting I couldn't believe he was cheating on me. I threw his car keys at him, started packing his stuff and told him to leave. There was a good 30 minutes that passed and I didn't think anything worked before I got a call from him saying he was stranded in the middle of the freeway. Oh. I told him to figure it out himself and went to bed. I haven't talked to him since, but I heard he paid $2,000 to fix his car and get it towed, and he still has no clue what happened. I laugh thinking about this, but I do know he was definitely broke during this time, so I get a tinge of guilt. So, am I rotten, or was this justified? Let's hear your thoughts. Uh, so my thoughts is that she is justified to be angry that, that he was, uh, like that he was dishonest with her. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there are probably healthier ways to, con <laughs> to confront that, um, yes. that are more that like in terms of communication. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I do think that like taking a step that could have actually put someone into like into danger, like in a moving vehicle and like it stops oh, working I didn't think of it that is, way. is probably one step too far. Yeah. I would say, oh. For me, when you're telling this long prompt of her going through all these steps, I'm thinking like that is definitely a very rotten, vicious, intentional way of getting back. Like it was very calculated, yeah. right? So there was so much that went into Maybe that. Maybe I'm so. just really toxic. And I didn't think of the safety aspect. That, that's the thing for me is the safety aspect. Okay. Yeah. If there was like no safety, she knew like it would just wouldn't start right away or something. I'd be like. Then you it's just what? being savage and That's like, just hey, you, hey, being hey, like hey, you, you know, know what? Okay. You do you and yeah. you get you get your revenge in your own little way because getting cheated on is sure. very you don't know how you're going to react in that. But I could see myself getting really mad. And maybe it's the the anger in me because I get morning anger and I get hangry <laughs> and like I, I don't, you know, I don't free write. Maybe I should practice that because I could see myself n maybe not going that far, but maybe doing some sort of revenge. I'd say she's pretty rotten for it. Really? Yeah. yeah. 
look <laughs> like, not the best way to handle it but look, yeah yeah i mean I, I to me to me where it crosses the line like or the, the line is the safety element like you know i don't i don't i'm i'm not a i don't mind a little savagery if you're if you've been if you've been wronged but yeah. like you know like you know you gotta think about some of the scenarios that could have played out like him on like a on a highway and like his car fails you know so it's true i think yeah. uh, if like you got into an accident right. yeah then she probably would feel like really really guilty and she probably would have been legally in trouble maybe or criminally in trouble maybe I'm would you sure, be criminally yeah. in trouble for that i'm, I'm shocked sure, she's admitting yeah. this i'm shocked she's admitting <laughs> that she did that that's crazy to me yeah i'm gonna say spoiled egg but yeah um it's just like a fun little thing if you guys want to be a part of the next rotten podcast um episode make sure to submit your submissions down below but yeah, it was honestly so fun so having great. you yeah, on. This was great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people out there that are interested, you know, we have brought on a lot of people in the NFT space. It sounds like you guys have a very similar mission, just really pushing the space forward. Where can people check out? We can drop a link below, right? Yeah, we'll we can drop a link. The- so for everything NFT now, uh, there's nftnow.com. It's at NFT now on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. Uh, and um, yeah, we're, we're across it like every platform. Definitely sign up for our newsletter, like yes. the, the NFT now newsletter. It's free, it's weekly, and it distills all the action in like the Web3 space into like actionable insights, like like a really easy to understand digest. You know, if you're just like trying to keep up on the space and like, you know, just want to like, like stay, stay like in, in the know, that's a great place to start. NFT now.com, sign up for the newsletter. And then, um, if you're if you're curious about the now pass, yes. um, you can go to nowpass.xyz to learn more about that. Yeah, I'll make sure to uh, leave down below the correct links for everything. It's minting in two days, right? Yeah, uh, so phase price? one. Yeah, so phase, phase one. so uh, so the mint date, uh, the now pass will mint uh, on March 23rd, Thursday, March 23rd. Phase one uh, and phase two allow lists, and then if it does end up going to uh, a public mint, which is phase three, that'll start uh, the morning of uh, fi- Friday, uh, March 24th. Um, I don't think we'll get to the 24th. I think you'll get it done in the first two phases. Yeah, right? I have faith. Inshallah. <laughs> I have faith that I'm it's putting it be out there. I'm out. believing it without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, so if you we'll- move, just your energy is incredible. I can't imagine the amount of conversations and people you've touched and have believe in you. So yes. I have full faith that you guys thank will you. sell out and crush it. And thank you. Now I want to get one because I'm like, I am well. so let's, bullish let's on you everything up. that you're saying, just the mentality, the mindset, the yeah. longevity. Mm-hmm. would love know, to have you be a part of the community. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. We'll, I, I don't think it's going to be for public sale, but hopefully we can get one on open sea. So there you go. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. If you guys aren't already make sure to follow us at rotten podcast and if you guys haven't submitted your ratings for us make sure to give us five stars on apple and spotify and we'll see you next tuesday bye guys bye guys